All right, we're live. Morning, everyone. Welcome to Berlin. <clears throat> Glad to have you here. I'm on stage today with... Hello, my name is Jaime Camaño. I work, I am a senior software engineer. I work in the NFB engineering team, SUSE. Mark here is my project manager. So I've been working OpenStack for a pretty good number of years. Uh, we've really been starting to develop some of the network uh, maturation process, uh, specifically around NFV in the telco space. That's what this talk is mostly about. Uh, there will be some, some setup that we're going to do on this. How many of you were at the Vancouver Summit earlier this year? Anyone? All right. So if you were at the demo theater, we gave part one. Uh, T.R. Bosworth, the other product manager from SUSE, standing right back there. And I gave a talk uh, at that. Uh, we're going to reference some of that because this is effectively a sequel talk to that where we really go into more, uh, a little more depth in what you really need to do to do a telco NFE compute environment. So you will find part one of that at the following URL. So need it, just do a search on uh, software defined all the way with OpenStack and you'll, you'll find that in the, uh, the OpenStack slide section. So a recap of what we discussed during that talk. Number one, migrating from a physical data center to a software defined data center. Uh, that, that basically, there's a three-legged stool that makes up, and you, you saw it in the keynote this morning from Jonathan, the three-legged stool is compute, storage, and network. So we walked through migrating the compute portion, migrating from, say, a traditional SAN over into a, a CES or Ceph-based product. Ours, uh, our Ceph-based product is called CES inside SUSE. Uh, and then we started talking about migrating networking. We broke out enterprise NFV and telco NFV. I'm going to give you a real quick brush up on that. It's going to take about five minutes of the talk. Uh, and then we're going to go specifically into some further details that you need to understand when it comes to doing telco NFV. So, software defined. Uh, this particular, this is uh, one of SUSE's architecture slides. Here's what a software defined infrastructure really looks like from our product set. And it's a fairly similar kind of environment that you're going to get across the open source world because we all work from the similar set of software, right? It's packaging, it's distribution, it's support that tends to vary. So, <clears throat> let's reestablish what we were talking about. Once again, this is a little bit of catch up from SQL or part one, you know, last week on SDI with SUSE, you saw, and that's what we're gonna run through for a moment. This is what a physical data center looks like. Those of you who have been network administrators or have worked in DCs for a lot of years understand this is a typical structure. So you're dealing with a different set of compute devices from mainframe, minis, micros, PCs, and so forth sitting on top of storage, say a storage area network, and then networked together using, and I know this is not gonna come out on the recording, but it will help you all in the audience. So basically everything networked together here, that's your set of storage switches that link together your, your array, and then you obviously have your compute layer. Okay, so standard DC, everyone should be comfortable with this. Now let's move on into migrating uh, over the, the migrating the compute layer. So what you end up doing with this is basically we've migrated away from the mainframes, minis and so forth that were in the prior set, and we've gone to a commodity-based KVM hypervisor. All right? We do have some special flowers out here. These are multiple types of hypervisors. Uh, SUSE does support multiple hypervisors in our cloud. OpenStack is built to be able to do that, and we also support containerization, and OpenStack supports Ironic. So across all of those, you can basically support everything from standard Linux KVM all the way through to bare metal. So very flexible environment, that's your compute layer. Moving into the storage layer, you'll notice that what's happened is the switch types have changed and the type of boxes down here have changed. This is a Ceph environment that exposes block, file, and object to you via storage all off of commodity hardware. And what really happens across this entire set, even though they're drawn differently, down here, basically the same type of Intel AMD uh, x86 or x64 hardware, same thing that you have across all of those devices. So it really allows you to economize and minimize the different types of hardware that you have to maintain. All right, let's make sure we're clear on NFV. So a real quick touch point about this. What is NFV? It is the virtualization of network functions. So put very, very simply, NFV is about taking stuff that used to run in, say, an appliance, a specific telco appliance, taking the software out of that box, moving it in, and running it in a Linux process somewhere. Fundamentally, at its core, that's what NFV is all about, okay? So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this slide. You'll be able to download the slides, and once again, you can go back for a more detailed discussion of this from last week or last time. All right. 
Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this one. How are we doing on time? Uh, actually got quite a bit of time, but I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time there other than saying inter enterprise virtualization. So go back to that prior slide. What you had in this era was you had, say, a dedicated hardware appliance, a box that was running DHCP and so forth, and that's actually running in your network layer. This, by the way, is a standard symbol for a router in the network world if you're not real familiar with it. So you're running all of those devices in an appliance or network layer. How do you migrate enterprise NFV? And I want to make sure that we're very specific about enterprise versus telco. Those actually migrate down into instances running on that compute layer. Put very simply, you're taking the software out of the firewall that used to be up here, and you're running it, say, in an IP table, as instance, down here inside KVM now. That's enterprise NFV. It has different performance requirements than does telco NFV. Enterprise NFV is not about massive throughput, it's about functionality and reliability. So you'll actually get a little bit more mode one requirements in this space in enterprise NFV than you might in telco NFV at times, or especially in cloud native type applications. All right, moving on to the next slide. Let's zoom in on an NFV node and talk about what telco NFV really looks like. We're going to get into data plane acceleration first. The driving factor when you get into telco NFV is data plane acceleration. It turns out there's a few others that Jaime is going to spend some time focusing on, but the real thing you need to do first is you need to accelerate data through the system. Why is that? For those of you who have never like built your own network switch, here's what a switch is made up of. It's a small low-end processor, either an Intel Celeron or an Atom, and I'm gonna, I'm, we're, we're partners with all the vendors out there, but I'm going to use those because you're probably very familiar with those chip names. So a Celeron or an Atom is basically your management processor. That's what runs the network operating system on that switch. Then you have one or more ASICs, and each ASIC or FPGA, uh, Field Programmable Gate Array, any one of those devices actually allows you to connect multiple ports to those, and then the data that's traveling from, say, from one network device to another goes through that ASIC. It does not go through the Celeron. So what happens is that FPGA is a very, very fast piece of equipment. The processor's not in the way. It just manages how that ASIC is configured. That's why switches can be fairly inexpensive. You're not paying for, you get into a, like a, a big Xeon, it's a more expensive piece of hardware. You can produce ASICs as your own switch company more cost effectively, all right? So, you need to replace that type of performance on a general purpose CPU that also has to do other things on the compute node. That's a problem. So data plane acceleration is all about how do you make that faster. So we have a pure user space technology in OpenStack, OVS DBDK, that runs 100% in user space, which solves a whole bunch of operating system issues, context switches, things like that. We have a hybrid approach in SRIOV where we can have a physical function on a NIC that exposes multiple virtual NICs and each one is basically user space mapped into each instance that's running, but that's a little bit more hardware focused. And then we have a very hardware centric perspective, which is PCI pass-through. So those three technologies basically go from very software defined up through a little bit more hardware focused. And that is presented in this particular slide. This was something that was a lot of value to people that when we talked to them at the Vancouver Summit, really tends to make clear to folks what these technologies do and how they actually work between user space, kernel space, and so forth. Okay? So once again, the slides will be available for you uh, for download later. All right, let's move on past the data plane now because a fast data plane, it turns out, is not enough. You actually need more than that. And why is that? Well, I touched on that a little bit in kernel context switches. How do you ensure that you end up getting repeatable, definable performance out of the kernel for tasks that are running if all of this is running in user space? If you have one task that has niced itself up to like the highest priority on the system, you could actually freeze your, your DPDK instance out and not get the throughput that you need to. Even though the data plane can operate fast, it's not getting any processing time, okay? So you need to solve that problem. How do you solve those kinds of problems? And the answer is first, we need to make sure we understand what the OS does. So this will be OS 101 for those of you who didn't take any OS or computer science classes. What does an OS really do? Four basic concepts. One, multiple tasks running on a system. How do you like time slice and protect between these, make sure they can't stomp on each other? That's, that's task one. Number two, how do you make sure that you actually context switch between these things correctly? Well, that's what a preemptive multitasking operating system does, okay? Linux, 
being Unix, is a preemptive multitasking operating system. Next, the kernel has to protect the hardware. All of these devices access the same hardware, so you have to have something that's protecting the hardware. So a kernel is in place to do that. And then you need a patching and update facility. Let's take a look at how these things actually apply in the NFE world. First, we've, we've covered the performance section, right? We've got a fast data plane running, so that's four different technologies, and I, I added in one more that's actually got a huge amount of activity going on that we're not going to delve into in this talk, but if we do, say, part three at a, future, at a future summit, then we'll start delving a little bit more into VPP, because this is a very exciting area right now. Updatability. Telcos require what I call mega uptime, minimum five to six nines. Their networks are built out of a lot of mode one stuff, and when your cell phone doesn't work, eh, customers tend to get pretty unhappy, Telco loses business, they flip to different plans or different providers, so they need major uptime, much more so than the vast majority of other networks do. This, by the way, is a real issue, and Jaime is going to be going into that and how we actually solve that particular problem. Predictability, we need more than a general purpose task scheduler, we need something that when you're processing protocols in a network world, you have to be on a very defined, repeatable basis. Otherwise, you get that VoIP chatter where the line breaks up and, or the video stops playing. So, that said, let's make an NFE compute node. You've got the floor, you've got nine minutes. Okay, Thank I'm you, Mark. walk behind you. So, what we did to showcase here those, uh, some of the features that Mark talked about before is that we deployed a SUSE OpenStack Cloud on top of a SUSE Linux Enterprise Compute Nodes. And we have a, a two compute node cloud, and one of them we have designated an, as an NFB capable uh, compute, and we have enabled uh, some features that we think that bring this NFB capability for the compute. Uh, so what we have, two of the basic features we, that we have for that is live patching that gives you the updatability, and then we have the real-time kernel to get predictability on your tasks. So we are going to showcase those specific features through a couple of videos that we have made, that uh, really, uh, that, so you can see what we are talking about. We're going to start with SUSE Live Patching. You want me to hit the video? I'll start the I video. Play the video. Can you stop it there for a second so I explain? Yep, I can. Sorry about that. Just pause it. Yeah. So what we have on the right is uh, one video conference uh, application that is being served on, the non -real, on a non-real-time compute, non-NFB compute. Uh, and on the left, on the left we, have, uh, we are logged in into the NFB compute. The NFB compute is running a BNF, it's a routing BNF. It's providing routing, firewall, and DPI services for all the traffic that is going to the video conference application. So on this uh, cell on the left, we're going to showcase how we are using live patching. Not live patching. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, kernel live patching. This, uh, kernel one, is, live this patching. one is live patching, that's yeah. right. So you can play it right now. Okay. So basically, we patch the kernel using the, the software maintenance tool of SUSE that is called Zipper. So you, you use the same tool to install software, to make updates, and to install kernel patches. Basically, first, what we're doing is we're just listing the patches. We are specifying the reposit software repository that is holding all the kernel patches just for simplicity of the output. So to really drive home the point of what's happening here, in a telco environment, you want to keep your node up and running all the time but kernel CVEs specifically are coming through. If you want to apply a security patch to a kernel, you need to inject that into the kernel. To pick that up on the vast majority of systems out there, you need to reboot to pick that up, and that just blows your SLA for the whole year. With SUSE Alive patching, you're able to actually apply that patch as the system is running, and that's exactly what this is demonstrating. The video player is a VNF running on the node that you're patching a CVE into the kernel all at the same time. And at the end of it, you've got your kernel patch picked up and you don't have to reboot the node. Say a year into the process, after you've done multiple CVEs, you can turn around and reboot that system and pick up the, the CVEs that actually have been patched into the on-disk kernel. 
Okay, so pretty pretty compelling technology that we believe you need for an NFE environment. Can you go back a second so I can explain the? Going to be tough for me to go back. How far back do you want me to go? Okay. So basically, we listed the, the security patches that we had available, and now we are installing it through Zipper, like you install any other piece of software. It's a bit slow because it's just uh, reinstalling the patch in the kernel and building on the Dracoon modules, but it uh, takes a few seconds. Now, the kernel has been updated, so we are running an updated kernel with a security patch uh, applied. Now we have different tools to, to inspect the status of the kernel update. One of them is KGR patches. It's going to list you the, 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 the kernel patches that are currently applied on the system. And we can see that the, the patch that we recently installed, 221, is, is already applied. The status is going to tell you if the system is completely uh, working on the latest version of the kernel that has been upgraded. When it says ready, it's that it's working, all the processes are working on the latest version of the kernel. The kernel patch is installed as a kernel module. So the technology that we're using is called CareGraph. It's, it's applied as a kernel module, and it's replacing all the kernel functions to new versions of those functions that need to be patched. All right, on to the next piece. OK. And now we're going to, to check a SUSE real-time kernel. So this NFV designated as NFV Compute is running a real-time kernel. I'm going to show a few bits about it. So th this is the same setup, video conferences are running on the, on the right. We are logging in the NFV compute on the left. We check that effectively it's running a real-time kernel, 4.4 real-time. And we're going to check the QEMU process that is running the NFV, uh, the VNF, 14 VNF. So we want to do this because we're going to inspect in detail this process to, to check if it's really running in real time scheduler. So uh, this BNF is running on two virtual CPUs, zero and one. Only one of those CPUs is running on a real time scheduler because uh, there's some management tags that still need to run and not real time. Uh, the first virtual CPU is running on the physical CPU two. The second virtual CPU is running a physical CPU 3. And we can see here that only the, the virtual CPU 2 is running on the first in, first out real time scheduler. The other CPUs and uh, threads of the QEMU process are running on normal scheduling. Now, what we're going to do is we are going to run a stress test. And we're going to verify that the stress test is not going to interrupt our service on the video conference. So what we're going to do is we're, we're going to stress all the cores except the cores where the BNF is running. So when you're running a real-time uh, VMs, you want to run the VMs on different cores for isolation. So we're going to test that that isolation is actually in effect and it's not going to, uh, the stress test is not going to affect the, B, the BNF. We're going to check how uh, the, stress test is, the stress test is running. It's running in CPUs 1 and 4 to 11, so it's not running on CPUs 2 and 3 where the BNF is running. Now, if we inspect all the threads that we're running on that stress test, all of them are running on real-time scheduler. So while the test, stress test is going on, there's really no effects, it's not, it does not affect the video conference at all. The video conference is still isolated in their own CPUs, running on real time, non-affected. If we run top, we can see that PS stress is really loading the system. All these threads that are running, that are running uh, stressing the system, and if we look into, this, on, into the CPU, we, we see that the VNF CPUs are more or less free of work, but the other CPUs are overloaded. The other, the other cores are overloaded. So this really shows how real time, how real time helps isolating your, your, your task on the, on the compute. And of course, it's also about predictability, which is very difficult to show on a demo, but supposedly all the other all the, all tasks that are running in real time have a predictable behavior in regards to timing. 
So that's all that we wanted to show in this talk. Thank you. All right, and we are at zero left on, on the clock. So uh, basically, quick summary, those are the three pieces we think you really need in the telco NFV space. Obviously, data plane, huge amount of work being done in the OpenStack environment. Uh, in terms of uptime, uh, we, we feel that there's huge value still in the operating system to bring here. Want to make sure you understand what those principles are. You all have a great summit. Thank you for attending. Uh, swing by the Sousa booth. We're at uh, B3. If you want to chat with us, right over there. You all have a great day. Thank you.